uh, we've uh, done a lot of medial meniscus, so I thought let me do something on the lateral side. So what we have is a 38-year-old lady. She has a BMI of 29. She's a physician. She uh, presents with a locked knee since a week following a trivial injury. Of course, because her knee is locked, her range is from 15 to 120 degrees. She's got a grade 1 effusion. Her lateral joint line is tender. Her alignment is neutral and her knee is stable otherwise. So these are her MR scans. Um, please feel free to ask me to run them again. So I can run them again for you. And uh, this is what it looks like. You can see that she's got a lateral meniscus which is deficient posteriorly and is displaced anteriorly. Okay. So this is her arthroscopic view. I'm sorry, what happened? Yeah. There we go. Hang on for a second. Yeah. So this is what her arthroscopic view looks like. Are, what happened to this slide? Hang on for a moment. Yeah. Maybe it's this one. Yeah. This is her arthroscopic view. I don't know why this wants to pop up. But she's essentially got a discoid lateral meniscus, uh, which is an incomplete type of a discoid lateral meniscus and this is detached on the posterior aspect. So this is how it looks like uh, after we've done a bit of uh, trimming and saucerization. And now I think the question is that of course this is a lateral discoid meniscus with a complex tear. It deserves surgical treatment. So we going back, I mean we did discuss, uh, Anil you did mention that uh, you know uh, you just get the knee into a deeper figure of four position to try and expose the lateral side. That also doesn't work. Then what do you do? Well my first pearl here, because if you, uh, if this wasn't a discoid meniscus, if you look at your MRI cut, your PL bundle has a lot of edema. Uh, whenever I see a, an isolate bucket of the lateral meniscus, I triple inspect the ACL because that ACL has to be stretched. It can be in continuity, but it has to be stretched. And I've gotten burned on isolated buckets uh, that, um, where I should augment the ACL. Now, it's a little bit different when, when, with a discoid because this could have been, you know, her meniscus for many, many years. Um, this, you know, I've never pie-crusted the LCL. Uh, I have pie-crusted the posterior lateral capsule, just like the posterior oblique. Um, uh, and what I think normally what you get in the figure four is by, you know, raising the Mayo stand, you get an attritional stretch in the lateral side. So in the beginning of the case, it's tight, and then eventually as you kind of work around there, it gets less tight. But I have put a spinal nail on the posterior lateral capsule. So I think that's a good point. Get a bolster underneath the buttock on the same side of the surgery. The reason being is that once you have a bolster there, I think it just gives you more working space. You have some people who still have a tight. How often have any of you, anyone on the panel resorted to doing a pie crusting of the FCL? Never. Okay. So I've done that a couple of times and there's, uh, it's been written up in literature as well. Especially when, I, when, I mean, Andreas, you've seen pa in patients with tight lateral compartments when you want to do a lateral meniscus transplant, it just gets so tough getting in there. I mean, you've got your incision there because you're doing inside-out sutures, so you've never done it because uh, I think when doing a lateral meniscus transplant, I very frequently end up doing it only in almost about 20% of patients. So if, I've definitely looked at lateral compartments that were tight and said, thank God I don't have to do a meniscus transplant for this patient. Um, I've always thought about it. I think in the total knee literature, it's been described to pie crust, but then they usually say, well, then we use a stabilized implant. So I've always been a little bit scared, so I'd love to hear more of your experience. Okay. So, um, I mean, I've done maybe about seven or eight of them now, lateral meniscus transplants with pie crusting of the FCL. And I've just found that, you know, just much like the principle on the medial side, when you want to get that MCL out to length, probably I think it just work, works just the same. And you do it when you have your incision, when you look correct. directly. So you the do incision it under in direct place. vision. Yes. yes, absolutely correct. That Sounds better. <laughs> Logical, yeah. Okay, choice of repair. Parag, uh, all inside, inside out, outside in? I always prefer all inside and, you know, it, so it looked more like a body and the posterior horn part where there was a, a tear of the superior and the inferior surface. So I would, my choice would be all inside. Okay, Kailash, how many sutures and what pattern? So, uh, uh, to the posterior part, I would put some horizontal sutures and the anterior I would prefer to do outside in. 
vertical sutures. Okay, so I think one of the important things when we look at repairing large tears of the lateral meniscus, especially that go right down to the root, is that when you come with your all inside devices through your anterolateral portal, your neurovascular bundle is at risk. And this is some data which does tell us that if you are coming in with an all inside device from the anterolateral portal, because you want to have a direct uh, perpendicular uh, sort of trajectory, then you have to be very careful because your popliteal artery is at a mean of almost about 4 millimeters away from the joint capsule. So you have to be very difficult as to how you penetrate. Which is why what is recommended is that you come in from the anteromedial portal. But my problem with this was that it would give a trajectory which would not run perpendicular to the tear pattern which is what we desire. So I think what we've used now is that with the advent of the flexible or the bendable all inside devices, that has been my way to go now. And I find that when you bend these devices, um, we probably have a couple of them on the market. This is the one that uh, you know I'm used to. So I find that you know using these uh, flexible devices which can bend almost up to 80 degrees uh, when you uh, can bend about 20 degrees in the needle and 60 degrees in the body of the meniscus, they allow you to you know uh, have a good trajectory. Uh, any experience uh, our colleagues from the HSS with the use of uh, these bendable devices and if so do you have any special ticks and trips as to how you circumvent any problems with them? So for this issue sometimes I use a transpatella tendon portal. Okay. So there was another study that looked at um, intermedial, anterolateral, the standard portals and then use of a transpatella portal and especially for this type of tear, if you do a transpatella portal, it's sort of a compromise. You can get to that area, so you have a better angle, but it still is in a safe zone. So I've used that. We do use the, um, the bendable all inside devices, um, so that, that's a good alternative as well. Right, but if you're bending it towards the artery, what's the, you, 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 I, don't think you're, I don't think you're solving the problem if you went, you know, contralateral, because you're still, you know, you're still bending it towards the trajectory. So uh, we use this, it's the new product. Um, um, to me, the issue would be, I would have done an all inside suture posteriorly, and then the next stitch then do uh, a, a suture configuration, because it seemed like there was a big horizontal cleavage component, so I would end a couple of hay barrels, and then I don't have to worry about that. So uh, this look, and look, But I wasn't sure if your meniscal capsular, there was another yeah, tear. There's another so tear. I, I would end a hay barrel posteriorly, and then posteriorly done a fast fix, then a hay barrel, then a fast fix. That yeah. would be my configuration. So the, the tear pattern was a peripheral longitudinal along with a horizontal cleavage, so that was the tear pattern. So I think you know all these points are very important and the reason to ask all these questions is that um, there are different ways and different techniques to repair complex tears and it's important that you be really well versed and you should have all the necessary tools uh, you know to repair um, the various zones of the meniscus. Would you, so, uh, sorry, yeah? would you prefer to change your portals and then use a device because a lot of people won't be access accessing these kind of curved devices or flexible 110%. devices. So I think uh, you know for tears like these it's really important that you have at least three portals minimum because uh, we, you're trying to reach different zones of the meniscus and we're trying to reach different zones of the meniscus. Y you know just two portals cannot be sufficient. You have to try and have more portals, put in a spinal needle, try and get the correct trajectory before you move in. And the other important aspect is that you need to use your hook probe as a reduction tool to try and get that meniscus to sit exactly where it has to sit. Uh, Sabrina, question to you. You know, when you start moving more towards the lateral side, now you're now looking at the popliteal hiatus. And that becomes another difficult area to repair. So do you impale the popliteus tendon in your repair? How do you prevent impalement of the popliteus tendon? Any tips and trips on that? So I don't worry too much about the popliteus. I don't care about impaling it, as you say. But for these larger degenerative tears, I tend to do typically inside out. And I think um, you get better fixation tying sutures over the capsule than you do with these um, anchors. It's not that I wouldn't use an anchor close to the root or an all inside device, but I think um, for these tears that have a cleavage component as well as a capsular component, I tend to do inside out. 
Okay, so this lady actually didn't want me to make a safety incision and I think uh, if I'm doing the lateral side, I would always, always make a safety incision uh, for the inside out repair. Uh, the safety incision on the lateral side has to be a decent large incision. You cannot do it through a very tiny hole because uh, you know the amount of exposure that you require to just reach that area which is bounded by the posterior capsule, the nerve and the uh, and the lateral head of the gastrocnemius requires a decent skin incision. So I think that's another important point that don't try and do inside out repairs on the lateral side without making a decent safety incision. The other aspect Sabrina is that on the same thing, on the same aspect, you know, you also want to make sure that you have those two popliteal meniscus fascicles that need to be looked up, uh, you know, that need to be re-anchored so as to say. When you do an inside out repair, especially in the area of the popliteal hiatus, uh, you are just trying to get, you are just trying to bunch the whole meniscus and the whole capsule together. Do, do you feel that makes any difference in the amount of mobility of the lateral meniscus because the lateral meniscus is more mobile than the medial side? Um, so my main concern, I, I echo Sabina in terms of, I, I don't worry too much about um, putting a stitch into the popliteas because especially in the more horizontal section, I don't know how mobile it is. What I do worry about is, is inadvertently putting a stitch into the LCL. It, it's rare, but um, I've revised, luckily not my own meniscus repair of somebody else, where they had continued pain in that area and then I did an incision and I saw like a repair device tethering the LCL. I think the other thing you can do in the area of the popliteus hiatus is um, to do an all inside. So if I have a, a bucket handle meniscus crossing the popliteus hiatus, I use either a knee scorpion or um, a soterix device to do vertical mattress stitches in that area. And that, that works neatly because then you don't have to penetrate um, peripherally. I think absolutely perfectly fine uh, points taken. So again I think the main uh, intention of presenting this uh, particular example was that you know it's not like a one-stop shop solution. Everything cannot be fixed by just one technique. You need to be aware of various different types of all inside techniques. So we have the all inside suturing Ceterex device. We have these uh, curved all inside devices. You have the straight uh, all inside devices and of course you have the inside out and the outside in. Okay, uh, Raju, do you add orthobiologics to your meniscus repairs? I mean, I won't ask the HSS people because they're going to give a different answer. So, do you always add? Are you selective? Never? And if so, which one? So, I uh, am quite selective. A uh, delayed presentation in a particular tier like this, I might add a fibrin clot, but it's uh, very far and few between. Okay, Anil? Uh, I do Ilya Crest. A BMAC, three to four cc's almost on every knee now, um, uh, especially if I'm not doing an ACL, and I would do that. Uh, the, you could do the tibia, you could do the femur, but the CFU units from the crest are superior, and it's a non-spin system, it's a special needle, um, I know Sabrina does it well, and it's, I do it for every degenerative knee scope, it's, it's cheap. It's cheap. Okay. Okay, Parak, what about you? So, uh, almost always we will do a microfracture in the notch which has already been described. That would be for all the cases. I'm selective about whether to put in a clot, you know, you just get some blood from the, the cubital veins and then you put it in. And that would be for some cases, you know, where I'm suspecting that this is a little elderly patient and I'm doubting my outcome. And these are the patients where I would uh, consider that kind of a, uh, putting a clot inside. So, that is the orthobiologic technique, but everybody gets uh, a microfracture in the notch. Yeah, I think it's important that when you're doing isolated repairs, you should do all of the mechanical techniques for sure, which is synovial rasping, which is doing trephination, which is doing microfracture in the notch to try and improve your healing rates. Um, if you can put in some form, of, uh, some form of a fibrin clot or something of that sort, I think it's definitely beneficial. And uh, this was uh, the repair at the, uh, this was the arthroscopic view at the end of the repair, which showed that the whole meniscus had been uh, repaired down. Kailash, rehabilitation for this lady and what sort of outcomes will you tell her? So, in general, uh, for all the meniscus repairs, uh, I would prefer about six weeks of non-weight bearing. 
Uh, then uh, gradual weight bearing depending upon the pain profile or pain tolerance. Uh, knee range of motion probably about 90 degrees we expect on day 2 or day 3 and gradually increasing later on uh, that's, and by about 3 months of the surgery full weight bearing. Uh, Sabreen, what's your protocol in HSS? I mean, how do you get them moving quickly? Do you get them moving slowly? Yeah. Um, so we let them start bending to 90 immediately. And uh, for, it depends on the repair. So a root is non-weight bearing for six weeks. A vertical tear like this, uh, typically toe touch for the first seven to 10 days, and then weight bearing locked in extension and a hinge knee brace for six weeks. Um, that being said, plenty of patients come in at six weeks without their brace, which yeah. um, I don't that's know pretty, if they actually do that's worse. That's pretty common here as well. So I think, you know, the discoid lateral meniscus is uh, a completely different ball game when you look at the, the various, uh, you know, outcomes of the discoid lateral meniscus. Though we are very well used to the Watanabe classification, I don't think it really has a lot of bearing in clinical use because what really matters is that uh, whether the peripheral capsular detachment is, uh, is present or not and in which direction do you have the peripheral ca capsular detachment because that is going to determine which way the meniscus tissue displaces and um, that is important to understand as to how it moves on and depending upon what sort of uh, whether you have, you have a symptomatic or an asymptomatic discoid lateral meniscus you would then need to then go ahead and decide what sort of treatment plan you do offer your patients. So I think uh, this is what I had to offer and uh, thank you so much for this. Yes.